everybody today and we again are so thankful to have the Havensteins with us this morning. Very excited to hear about their ministry. It's just so exciting, the, the college ministry. I love that. So. so we are in the Old Testament book of Exodus, uh, which is it's the second book in the Hebrew Bible. And we're kind of going through it. We're, we're in chapter 4, pivotal chapter, but already we, we've been introduced to, to the main character in the story, which is God, and, uh, and also Moses, the reluctant leader. Uh, God calls Moses to lead the people out of Egypt, and, and Moses tells God five reasons why that's not a good idea. He's got the wrong guy, but... But God is persistent, and we, we've just finished the burning bush scene, um, and yeah, God, God tells them, hey, I'll give you a staff, you can do wonders with the staff, I'll give you your, your older brother Aaron, he can speak for you, all the bases are covered, you're the guy, you're going to do this, and I mean, Yahweh is with Moses, he's with them, he doesn't need to be afraid, and so with all of that, Moses sets off. He, he has a plan. He knows what to do. He's got the staff. He's got the brother. He's got Yahweh with him. He's, going, he's commissioned, like a, much like a missionary gets commissioned. He's going back to Egypt. But folks, today's sermon, <laughs> we are going to dive into arguably the most confusing text, not only in the book of Exodus, but in the entire Hebrew Bible, okay? It's, it's a strange, strange story. And, and I was so tempted, you have to believe me, I was tempted to just skip over this, you know, just skip over it. It's, so, it's super dense. It's not that long. I could easily have done it, but I, I decided against that because it is in the Bible for a reason. I, I, I do believe that. And I think if we sit with it long enough and ask some basic questions, I, I do think uh, it, it'll, um, it'll help us ultimately. I mean, it, it's scripture and it will help us. And so, it's strange, though. I'm, I'm telling you, it's strange. But here's the, here's the title of, of today's sermon. Exodus Part 5, uh, Less Than a Hopeful Start. Okay, that's the, that's the sermon title. Because, yeah, Moses is flying pretty high at the, in the middle of chapter 4. He's just been commissioned by Yahweh. But by the end of this sermon, Moses will have almost been killed have a showdown with Pharaoh that did not go well and want to give up because he thinks he's made everything worse. But we will also see how, how and when and why God shows up in the end. So, on to the most confusing part of the whole book. And I just want to read it in its entirety and, and you'll see why it's so strange. So, here we go. This is Exodus 4, starting in verse 18. Then Moses went back to Jethro, his father-in-law, and said to him, Let me return to my own people in Egypt to see if any of them are still alive. Jethro said, Go, I wish you well. Now the Lord said to Moses and Midian, Go back to Egypt, for all who wanted to kill you are dead. So Moses took his wife and sons, put them on a donkey, and started back to Egypt. And he took the staff of God in his hand. The Lord said to Moses, when you return to Egypt, see that you perform before Pharaoh all the wonders I've given you power to do, but I will harden his heart so he will not let the people go. Then say to Pharaoh, this is what the Lord says, Israel is my firstborn son, and I told you, let my son go so he may worship me, but you refuse to let him go so I will kill your firstborn son. At a lodging place on the way, the Lord met Moses and was about to kill him. But Zipporah took a flint knife, cut off her son's foreskin, and touched Moses' feet with it. Surely you are a bridegroom of blood to me, she said. So the Lord let him alone. At the time, she said, bridegroom of blood, referring to circumcision. See? I told you. Now, 
Here's some free advice. Whenever you're in the Bible, and especially in the Old Testament, and there is a very condensed, confusing part in the narrative, it's almost like let the reader know this is there probably so that you make some connections either with an earlier book like Genesis that we've kind of been seeing a lot of Exodus is pinging Genesis, or how does this strange story connect with the, the rest of the book that it's in? Okay, that's just kind of free Bible advice when you're reading, and, and there's going to be times, there's times where, you, where you're reading and you're just like, what in the world is this about? Okay, and, and this is one of those uh, times. Um, so, anyway... I, again, because, so yeah, it's here for a reason, and it's here so that you can chew on this, so you can meditate on where does this connect, what's going on. This, after all, is ancient Hebrew meditation literature. That's what the Bible is. So, okay, Okay, we all know the confusing part, but the, the start was weird too, wasn't it? I mean, here Moses is going to his father-in-law and saying, hey, let me go back to Egypt just to see if anybody's still alive. Huh, like, like that's a little confusing too, is it not? I mean, is, that, is he lying to his father-in-law? Or, or is he getting shy? Or does he just not think that, I mean, it, it is like, is he going to tell him, yeah, Yahweh met me at a burning bush and told me that I, he's appointed me to go and, and get his people out of Egypt. I mean, that, yeah, that is a little tricky to explain to people. So, so anyway, what's going on with this? Is this a white lie? Is this nothing? Like, what is going on in Moses' head that he would tell his father-in-law this? We don't really know, but regardless... Jethro doesn't put up a fight. Just go. I wish you well. All right, go. Go for it. Uh, so he gathers up his two boys and his wife. He heads to Egypt. And then God, in this confusing part, God kind of foreshadows to Moses all that's going to go down. He tells Moses what, you know, what to do when, he get, when you get to Pharaoh. And notice in this strange episode, God, Yahweh caused calls Israel God's firstborn son. That's new. That, that's a new note in the, in the music. That, that has not happened before. So that, that Israel is God's firstborn son. I mean, that's out of Yahweh's lips. Okay, so kind of we got to hold that. And then God tells them that he's going to kill Pharaoh's firstborn son. That's, that's a reference to the last plague uh, so that's the tenth and final plague is, is that. But all of this, it, notice how quickly, I mean, that's verses 21, 22, 23, just really quick. And then the really strange part in verse 24. Let's just read it again. Because it, it, it should have caught everybody. Like, what? Verse 24, at a lodging place on the way, the Lord met Moses and was about to kill him. That's what the Hebrew says too, folks. That's, that's not just like, and we, we're, we're supposed to stop and just be like, wait a minute, Yahweh just commissioned him to go. Why does he want to kill him all of a sudden? Hold, hold that thought. Let's just keep reading. Maybe it'll clear up. It, it won't, but maybe. <laughs> Verse 25. But Zipporah, that's his wife, Moses' wife, took out a flint knife, cut off her son's foreskin, touched Moses' feet with it. Surely you're a bridegroom of blood to me, she said. So the Lord let him alone. At the time, she said, bridegroom of blood, referring to circumcision. So many questions, literally so many questions that I have been wrestling with for two weeks now. And I'm just going to unload them on you so you feel the tension. Okay, and literally, I'm going to put them on the screen. These are the questions that went through my head. Maybe they're going through your head. Number one, yeah, who is who's Yahweh trying to kill? Like, 
In the Hebrew, it's super vague. It's just him. Yahweh met to, was going to kill him. Who's him? Moses? Ger Gershom? The, Moses' son? Who, who is him? Um, and if it's Moses, why would circumcision, circumcising Gershom be the answer? To, 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 why would that be the answer? That's one question. That's two. Two questions. Here's another one. Why would Yahweh try to kill Moses right after commissioning him? Does this remind you of any other biblical story? Oh, maybe in Genesis, Genesis 32, that other strange story with Isaac and that person coming and wrestling with him all night long. And oh, that, that turned out to be Yahweh, that, well, or Jesus, however you want to. That, yeah, Genesis 22, that's another weird chapter in the Bible. And it, Bible nerds connect a lot of dots between this strange story and that strange story. So that's a little fun homework for you if you want to do that. But more questions. More questions need to be asked. Why is Moses passive in this story? He's completely passive. Do you guys catch that? Like, he got his wife and donkey and kids, and then he's just silent. Here's another one. Why had Moses not already circumcised his boy? What's up with that? Was Moses circumcised? If we're asking that question, why not ask that? Yeah, this one. Was Moses circumcised? How did Zipporah know what to do? Uh... Whose feet did Zipporah touch with the foreskin? Again, in, in the Hebrew, it's super vague, too. It's just Zipporah touched his, uh, Moses's, Gershom's, Yahweh's feet. What is going on? Uh, here's another one. And some of you know this. In feet in the Bible can refer, can refer to male body parts. It's a euphemism for male body parts. Is that, so is it really feet or is it that? Uh, who drew back from whom after she performed the ritual? So many questions. And then lastly, what does her statement mean? What is a bridegroom of blood? What does that mean? That's, that, nowhere in the Bible is that. Only in this story does that come up in the Bible. So, and I'm sure you have more questions. But those are, my, those are my top ones, okay? So here's what I aim to do now, is, is just look at the literary design of the book. And hopefully that will shed some light on this extremely confusing passage. For starters, I don't think it was a coincidence that Jethro shows up, right? And, and it's a passing show up, but he does show up. Jethro shows up in chapter 4, right here at this scene. That's... That's Moses' father-in-law. Then when does he show up again? But Exodus 18. Okay, Exodus 18, right before Exodus 19 is Mount Sinai. So he shows up at Exodus 18 and Exodus 4 as book, and not just shows up, but has a conversation with Moses. Now, albeit in chapter 4, very short, chapter 18, a little longer, but it's like little bookends. It's like, hey, chapter 4 to 18 is the Exodus or uh, the Israelites' deliverance out of Egypt. What that was. It started with the plagues, then it was the uh, walking on dry ground, and then it's three chapters of them wandering in the desert. But Exodus 19 is Sinai. But right here, is, is booking. So, so that's interesting. Remember how I said at the beginning that the author of Exodus goes to great lengths in connecting Moses' life, what Moses goes through, to what Israel goes through. Remember? Moses' life is chapters 1 through 4, and every a, a lot of what he goes through, the people go through in their deliverance. Okay? And so... Um, again, looking back at Moses' life, women play a crucial role in, in, in saving Moses. We, we could talk about 
the Hebrew midwives, uh, Shipra and Pua. We could talk about Miriam, Moses' sister, Moses' mother, Pharaoh's daughter. All of them helped to save Moses in, in, in the early part, chapters 1 through 4. And then who saves Moses this time? Ah, oh, it's another woman. It's his wife, Zipporah. Saves the day. She In the story, she is the only one that knows what in the heck is going on, is, is Zipporah. <laughs> it's, it's her. It's only her. And circumcision is the answer. Now, now why, right? The, why, why is a bloody act the answer? Why did Zipporah cutting off presumably Go- Go- Goshen's foreskin then placing it placing it on presumably Moses' feet, how does that save the day? Well, again, if indeed the author is modeling what happens in Moses' life to what happens in the Israel as a whole, we need this story. We, we We need this bloody story in Moses' life so that the Passover story makes sense, okay? Circumcision here anticipates Passover here, okay? Blood, blood as a way of identifying the covenant people. Circumcision, identifying the covenant people through Passover here. So in the story with Moses, there's blood deliverance of foreskin that saves Moses' firstborn. And in the wider story of Exodus, we have another blood sacrifice of lamb covering the door, if we remember the Passover story, that, that saves all of Israel firstborn with the Passover. So we need this story in order to complete the order of events that link Moses' story to Israel's deliverance. Again, this, this bloody, confusing moment identifies the covenant people. Um, and, yeah, so, and, and again, so far in the book of Genesis, right, we don't have the whole law yet. We're going to get it at Sinai. At Sinai, we're going to get the law. But, but so what does, what does the book of Genesis give us to identify the, the Israelites, circumcision. That's what they had. They, they didn't have the Ten Commandments yet. That's coming in Exodus. But they had circumcision. So why in the world didn't Moses circumcise his boy? And I believe the answer could be, again, going back to, he didn't know who he is. He still was wrestling with his identity. Moses struggled with his identity. Is he, is he Hebrew or is he an Egyptian? And as, as Moses is finally going to go back to Egypt, he has to know in his heart who he is. He has to believe Yahweh on his identity, what God tells him he is. And, and what have we seen with Moses already in this confusing story? We see kind of waffling. He goes to Jethro. Yeah, l- let me see about my family. Let me see if they're still alive, right? It's not, the, it's not the bold Yahweh told me who I am and I need to go to get Israel out. It's not that. We just kind of see this. I got to go see about my family. And Jethro's like, okay go you know so yeah uh, what if this what if this story is uh, there's a lot going on but what if God is saying you have to be rock solid here on who you are you know when I was a youth pastor I I I was one for 13 years, and, and at the tail end, I finally figured out a little bit of what I believe, working with teens, they're asking three primary questions. Every teenager, either subconsciously or consciously, they're asking three primary questions, and they, they ha- I, I believe they have to ask and answer 
these questions. Number one, who am I? Am I loved? And to whom do I belong? Those questions dominate. Again, subconsciously or consciously. Think, think back to your middle school. Remember that? Remember middle school? High school? All you, who am I? Does anybody love me? Where do I fit in? Who do I belong to? You, you, you have to answer those questions. And if you, do, if you carry those questions into your 20s and 30s, it's just going to make life really hard and really confusing. Because guess what? Your 20s and 30s, you have questions, right? And you just pile up and pile up. Here, Moses is 80 years old. And he has not figured out number one. Who am I? He hasn't figured it out. And, and, and what if this strange story is God's way of saying, Moses, you cannot go into this next phase without knowing where your allegiances are. Are you with me or not? Like, you've got to figure this out. You have to know who you are. And so in this dense, strange story, we have Moses who didn't circumcise his son because, again, if he doesn't know who he is, well, who am I to tell Gershom who he is, right? If we don't deal with our stuff, guess where it's going to go? Right down the line to our kids. And, and, and yet we have another woman coming in clutch to save the day. She performs this act on Gershom, her firstborn and I think it does a twofold thing. For her point of view, right, for Zipporah's point of view, it shows that she wants her and her family to be in the covenant, right? Because she's a Midianite, everybody. She's not Jewish. Remember that whole part. So here's this non-Jewish woman saving the day, literally. And, and, but in this act, she's saying, hey, I want me and mine to be with Jewish. <laughs> I want to be on the winning team here. Before, it, before the plagues, before all of that, she's saying to Yahweh, I'm in. Right? And I believe, I believe she takes the foreskin from her son, puts it on Moses' foreskin, because I, I do think Moses was circumcised because we, we, we think Egyptians did circumcision, but much like today, there was no ritual about it. It's just, you know, what you do. It's not symbolic. It's just, you know, every father gets asked, you know, hey, hey, you got a son, modern day hospital. Well, do you want circumcision or not? And they either do it or they don't. But there's nothing, there's no, there's no symbolic, there's no religious. It's just, it just is what it is. So I think Moses probably was circumcised, but... Her act of doing the foreskin on, on him, it, it, it was a dual thing, meaning that, that this display covers both of them in, in one act, Moses and Gershom. So, so again, this bloody act saved them here in chapters 1 through 4 so that another bloody act would, would save Israel in chapters 4 through 18. <sighs> So everybody, <laughs> that's my best shot. <laughs> like I, I just if you still have questions about what the heck is going on, me and you can com commiserate. We, we can go to my office. We can talk more. But that's that's my best guess at what in the world's going on here. I do think uh, what's going on with Isaac in Genesis thirty-two is is, is it, there's there's something's going on there too, but that's like a whole other sermon. So anyway, on to point number two, folks. Okay, where where Moses and Aaron finally meet face to face with Pharaoh. Here's the showdown. It's it's uh, Exodus chapter five verse one. If you want to turn in your Bibles, or, or we got it on the screens. Afterward, Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and said, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, 
Let my people go so that they may hold a festival to me in the wilderness. Pharaoh said, verse 2, Who is the Lord? Who is Yahweh that I should obey him and let Israel go? I do not know Yahweh. I will not let Israel go. Now, now this scene is pivotal here because it fi- it's like finally we get there after, after so much work. Moses and Aaron and the staff are there with, in front of Pharaoh and it's the, the famous, thus saith the Lord, let my people go. And, but then, I mean, did he notice? And it's easy not to, but it's just Pharaoh's there and he says, who's Yahweh? I, I don't. I don't know Yahweh. I don't care. You know, these are fighting words here, right? Like, shots are fired here. Uh, Pharaoh claims to not even know who Yahweh is, hasn't heard of him. And so they, they, they try again, right? Moses and Aaron, verse 3. Then they said, well, the God of the Hebrews has met with us. Now let us take a three-day journey into the wilderness to offer sacrifices to the Lord our God, or he may strike us with plagues or with the sword. So here's another question. So is Moses and Aaron, like this, this first offer of, hey, let's just go for three days in the wilderness so we can offer sacrifices, is that, is that a ruse? Is that... Is that uh, disingenuous or are they just saying hey let us go and then then they go or or would they go for three days and come back we don't really know because pharaoh doesn't give i mean pharaoh doesn't even give them a chance three days folks like that's a long weekend i mean that's just it three three days um but pharaoh's answer shows us a lot about his character who pharaoh is um, because not only does he refuse, but he makes the work harder. And again, this is, by the way, classic psychological abuse 101 here is what, what, what we're going to see from the Pharaoh. Um, just watch what the Pharaoh does and how he answers. Well, let's, let's go to, well, watch how he manipulates Israel, v- verse 4. But the king of Egypt, Pharaoh, said, Moses and Aaron why are you taking the people away from their labor? Get back to your work. Then Pharaoh said, look, the people of the land are now numerous, and you're stopping them from working. That same day, Pharaoh gave the orders to the slave drivers and overseers in charge of the people. You're no longer to supply the people with straw for making bricks. Let them go and gather their own straw, but require them to make the same number of bricks as before. Don't reduce the quota. They are lazy. That's why they're crying out, let us sacrifice. Let us go and sacrifice to our God. Make the work harder for the people so that they keep on working and paying no attention to these lies. Now, did you see what just happened there? I mean, instead of focusing on his stinginess being a taskmaster, Pharaoh says that, Israel's the problem. They are the ones that are lazy. I mean, my goodness, again, all Moses asked was just a one long weekend. Can we just have one long weekend? And Pharaoh doubles down, right, gaslights a little bit, and, and, and says, you know, that, that they're lazy. That they, they're lazy. Um, and, and he says, I don't know who Yahweh is. You're so lazy. That's why you're asking for time off. Let's have you work harder. This is classic abuse, psychological manipulation 101 here. This is what the Pharaoh does. Um, Pharaoh attributes laziness to them when really he's the problem. So now Moses and Aaron did what the Lord commanded them to do, but it made Israel's life harder, not easier. They have to do the same amount of quota, but they have to get their own straw. Pharaoh doesn't even acknowledge Yahweh at all, doesn't doesn't care who he is. I mean, things are looking very grim. And, And let's just read verse 22. 
Moses returned to the Lord and said, Why, Lord? Why have you brought trouble on this people? Is this why you sent me? Ever since I went to Pharaoh to speak your name, he's brought trouble on this people, and you've not rescued your people. I mean, think about it for Moses. Maybe Moses just thought this would be a slam dunk. Maybe Moses thought this wouldn't be that hard. Again, he's got the staff. He's got his brother. He's got Yahweh with him. Maybe this is just, he was thinking, oh, just one or, one or two conversations with Pharaoh. And I'm sure, you know, I can throw the snake down and do that trick. And, but, man, it's, it's an immovable wall here. And all of a sudden, I think it's dawning on Moses like, oh, no. Th- this is going to be a lot harder than I thought. And, and I did what you told me to do. And it's made things worse. It's gotten harder, not better. Um, and I could just, he's just like, where, where are you? Right? Like, where, where's the rescue? You told me to rescue your people. Like, where, where's the rescue? This is somewhat a repeated theme in the, in the Bible. Moses and, and a lot of other people do what they're told, but there's, there's either silence on the other end or it takes longer, right? I mean, just look at Jesus on the cross. Why have you forsaken me? Where are you? I, I, I'm doing what you're telling me to do, but I, I don't feel you anymore. I don't sense you anymore. This is, this, Moses is right there, too. And, and again, I, I kept on thinking, why, why couldn't, like, okay, if, <laughs> if I'm God, right, or if I'm Moses, let's just save the people. Okay, Pharaoh said no. Let's go. Let, let's just go tonight. Let's, let's do the splitting thing and let's just go, right? But, but that, like, that would not accomplish what God wants to accomplish in the Exodus, he could could he have done that? Yes, Th- things could have just gone fast, smooth. It, it, he's all he's all powerful. It could have been that, which tells me the Book of Exodus is not just God saving a people group. It is that, but it's not only that. It's about God showing Israel. Egypt, the world, what he's like, and his character. Pharaoh just said, I don't know who you are. I don't, I, who's Yahweh? One of the most repeated phrases, not only in the book of Exodus, but also in the rest of the Hebrew scriptures, is mighty hand, and an outstretched arm, right? With a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. It's it's in Exodus 6, 13, 14, repeated. Uh, It's in Jeremiah, ton, Isaiah, like all of it, like with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Did you know, I want to show you a picture here. Yes, good, thank you. So this is, this is called the Narmar, Narmar uh, palette. This is Egyptian. It's actually, it's actually a makeup tray, essentially. Like, it's, it's about the size of your palm, and on, one, on the back end is, is this. On the other side is where, you would, where they would mix their makeup and put their makeup on. But, but we have this, and this is, this is Pharaoh. I mean, this is the logo for Pharaoh. Notice he's got a mace in one hand and an outstretched arm grabbing uh, another Egyptian's hair by the hair. And, and this, this is the symbol for Pharaoh for literally 3,000 years, is, is this symbol, okay? This logo, this symbol, mighty hand, outstretched arm, uh, Almost like when uh, it's football season, so for, for, the, for the Heisman, right? If I do this, surely you know what that is, right? The, he- uh, 
right? Everybody? I'm getting super self-conscious. No, but, but that's the Heisman, right? The Heisman stance or whatever. That is the Pharaoh's logo for 3,000 years. We know that from archaeology, okay? Pharaoh just said, I don't know who Yahweh is. Yahweh is literally going to take Pharaoh's uh, logo, if you will, and say, oh, you don't know who I am. Well, I, w w with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, you will know who I am. You're, you're about to, and not only Egypt, the whole world is about to know who I am. I mean, the rest of the Bible. Again, when I say mighty hand and out, an outstretched arm, you you know, even, even if you never studied Exodus, you're like, oh, I, that's God. It's, that, it's because Yahweh took Pharaoh, what Pharaoh, his, his picture, his essence, if you will, and, and let just we're gonna one one last verse here, Exodus six verse one. At, after Moses is in the pits, he's feeling sorry for himself. Then the Lord said to Moses, "Now, now, not before, right? But right, right when, right when you're on the ropes, Moses. Right when you're feeling it. Right when you're down. Right, right, right when." You, Right when Pharaoh thinks he's got the upper hand, now you will see what I will do to Pharaoh. Because of my mighty hand, he will let them go. Because of my mighty hand, he will drive them out of his country. God is on the move. Not in the way Moses thought it would go, Definitely not in the way Pharaoh saw it coming, but he's on the move. And, and ah, folks, I don't know where you're at right now. I don't know what you came in with. Um, maybe right now you're in the long line of people over the, year, the years that are just like, where are you, God? Why? What's taking so long? I'm, I'm doing what you told me to do. And it's taking for it's seemingly forever. And you're trying to do whatever is before you. And maybe it's getting harder, not easier. May you take comfort in the fact that God knows what he's doing. Maybe you need to see the bigger picture. I, I don't know. Or, or maybe you're just being forced to wait. You thought it would be quick and easy, right? Oh, t two conversations with Pharaoh and we're good. And it's way longer. But look to God. Look to God to comfort you, guide you, strengthen you. That's what Moses did. That's what Jesus did in his dark time on the cross. And we need to as well. Let me, let me pray for us. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Sometimes it is not easy to read or... Um, yeah, to think on, but, but Lord, with the Holy Spirit, and, and with the, our church family, we can read it together and, and, and um, get a sense, Lord, of, of what's going on. And so we thank you for your word. And we thank you that you are the God that has a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. You can do amazing things, Lord. And... and we ask for your will to be done. God, we have our will, and, and, and we, we want certain things, and, and 
But, but ultimately, God, we just give it all to you. Your way is better. Your way is right. And so, Lord, help those that are burdened. Help those that are weary. Would you strengthen us for the task ahead? And would you show us that you, your hand is still mighty? You're still in the business of, of leading people. And now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever and ever. Amen.